gospel lesson for this Sunday is found in the book of John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus continues his lesson about feasting upon his flesh. Those who eat of my flesh and drink of my blood abide in me, and I in them, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever eats of me will live because of me. This is the bread that came from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died, but the one who eats of this bread will live forever. Now he said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, Teach, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? What if, I were to, what if you were to see the Son of Man descending, ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the very first who were the ones that did not believe. And who was the one who would betray him? And so he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because, <laughs> because of this, many of the disciples turned back and no longer went about him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also go away? Peter said to the Lord, said to him, You ready for this? Take a moment and hear these words. Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Didn't we just sing that just a moment ago, right? We have come to believe and now know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heavenly Father, bless this word today. We come to you, for you are the one who has the words of eternal life. And for this we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. This is our last uh, in the series of the, the month of August about the I am statement of Jesus. I am the bread of life statements. And so this is our last opportunity to hopefully bring canned goods and make a donation to the church on behalf of the poor that they might be fed and, and understand that, uh, that their hunger might be uh, fed their physical hunger might be fed, and that in the feeding of this hunger, they might also receive Jesus Christ. So we are inviting you one last time to bring your canned goods as a part of your offering for today. We are also asking you to, if you would like, send a check to the church just for food offering, for the poor, the needy, we will make sure that every dime of that is used to bless the poor of our community and the feeding of their bellies. Because when we bring canned goods into their homes, we are literally bringing Jesus into their homes as well. They are signs of his love for them. You have a privilege and opportunity to participate in that. Uh, I know if you didn't get in by today, you can bring it next week. Um, we would certainly be grateful for that. But let's take a look at this lesson for today. A little bit about the background, because we've been focusing on the same lesson over the last four weeks. Jesus, again, has identified himself as the great I Am. In other words, he's claiming to be from heaven and told them if they feast upon him, his flesh and his blood, he will give to them eternal life. It sounds like a pretty gross thing. This is, again, why our where many of the first uh, century Romans got this idea that Christians were cannibals, okay? Believe it or not, you see the Romans arguing whether or not Christians were cannibals, and you've got one guy who says, I don't think they mean that literally, by the way. The opponents of Jesus are fixated on this literalistic interpretation of his flesh and blood, and they are offended by Jesus' identification with the Almighty God. And even we're told that many of Jesus' disciples are so offended that they cease following him. That's where, again, we get that phrase, when Jesus turns to 12. Are you going to leave me too? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus says these phrase, this phrase that we are going to look at today, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. 
That requires some splaining, okay? Because some Christians have gotten this impression that the body is a non-spiritual entity and that we're spirits contained in these fleshy bags. That's, by the way, a heresy called Gnosticism that is not what Jesus is talking about. And it doesn't mean what you think. We often think, again, that means that the body itself, this flesh and blood, is useless. It's not outright, not downright evil. And so we need to kneel down on our knees and pray every single day and do spiritual things. Because that's the only thing worthwhile. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Our bodies are not evil. This flesh, this blood is not evil. Jesus is using that word flesh and blood in a metaphorical way. This is a good thing. God made the flesh. It is beautiful in God's sight. You are made in God's image. Therefore, beautiful in God's sight. Your body is, this body is inherently literal body, not metaphorical body. This literal body of yours is inherently beautiful and spiritual. It's how you use it that is or, not, is or is not spiritual in the way metaphorical means by which Jesus is talking. Your body has been gifted to you so that you might interact with other people and be in communion with God's creation. When we die and go to heaven, we are not going to be disembodied ghosts or spirits up there in heaven. We will be resurrected to new life. Physical bodies. We will have physical bodies in heaven. We'll be physical, spiritual beings. So what does Jesus mean? Again, by saying the, the, that the flesh is useless. He's not talking about this body. He's talking metaphorically. The spirit is the thing that gives us life. Those things that are focused upon God are the things that give us life. The physical experience, I am telling you, can be just as spiritual a thing as any type of contemplation or devotional experience we might have. So I will say, folks who say, well, I go and have a really deeply spiritual experience by walking in the woods. Yes, you do. God is present in the woods when you take a hike or when you extend your body physically. I will tell you some of those spiritual things and times in my life or when I, when I used to go out for a run, a good hard six to ten mile run, and you'd be just focusing on each step and every single breath, and it became such a liberating spiritual experience. I've told you how I will pick up my guitar sometimes, and I'll just start playing a picking pattern of some sort. That, that, that physical activity just frees me in a spiritual relate, my spiritual relationship with God. So physical things work, use of the body, can be a very spiritual experience. So what does Jesus mean when he says the flesh is useless? Well, glad you asked, right? The flesh again does not refer to our physical bodies. It refers to things that we do with our bodies. Again, sports, food, hiking, the love of art and music, these are not by nature of the flesh. It's how they are used that determines whether they are fleshly according to the metaphorical way in which Jesus is speaking about it. They're not somehow lesser of importance. A person who goes out and takes a 10-mile run is no less spiritual than the person who kneels on their knees and prays. I, I, did I already tell you, can't do that. It's not me. There are some Christians who get down on their knees and they pray for an hour. Good for them. That's not me. Don't do it, because I don't have that ability. I do go out and take a 10 mile run. Well, not anymore. I'll take a bike ride, and that's my prayer time. And it's a very devotional time for me. It's no less meaningful than a person who gets down on their knees at their bed and folds their hands and prays to God, okay? The flesh refers to those pursuits that do not honor God. Fleshy pursuits can be physical. They can also be devotional in nature. We told you many times about Martin Luther, who used to pray to God and was so obsessed about getting his body 
to uh, in his spiritual uh, in his thoughts and in his spiritual orientation that he would take a whip and beat himself with it. That's a fleshy pursuit. That is not a devotional pursuit. Beating yourself up is not a kindness and has nothing to do with God. It doesn't honor God in any way. It was useless to Martin Luther. And once he realized that it was useless is when his life was transformed. Okay? Any pursuit that takes us from relationship with God is a useless pursuit. So, making money is important to feed your family, but when your obsession becomes money, and it becomes a status symbol, it's a useless, fleshy pursuit. So I, I, I will tell you what, you know, how much money is enough for a person? Well, money is a tool. It's like a hammer. How many hammers do you need? You need enough hammers to do the job of living life, and that's it. When you have more hammers, so many hammers that you just don't need it for life, i.e. a billionaire, sorry, billionaires don't need a billion hammers. It's ridiculous. They have obsessed over fleshy pursuits, okay, that is not devotional in nature, that takes them away from their relationship with God. When we associate success with status and power and money, we are engaged in fleshy pursuits. But again, I caution you, because we don't always know the whole story. All right? What is fleshy for some people might not be for other people. So we can't reflexively, automatically say, well, this amount of money is how much money you should have, and none anymore. That would be like the Jews creating a hedge around the law. I don't know. Maybe you're creating jobs for people. A lot of billionaires are not. Most billionaires today are not creating jobs for people. They're stealing jobs from people. Because what they do is they dismantle the corporations that they buy. And they fire all the people and make an instant profit out of the corporations that they're taking over. So that they can uh, grow their bank account. I, I will outright say that people whose only job in life is to make money by buying companies are people who are actually doing a lot of damage and are, are pursuing fleshy pursuits. But I am going to say that there are billionaires who've made their money by creating jobs for people. And that's a blessed thing. That's a wonderful thing. And maybe they keep it so they can continue to make jobs for other people. Fantastic. So I'm not here automatically judgmental of that. What's fleshy for you may not be for somebody else. But I can't always tell you that if your only pursuit in life is making money, or the pursuits of this world, then you have somehow misunderstood what it is to have a relationship with God. Some experiences that bring me closer to God might do nothing for you. So again, somebody might be kneeling on their, the ground and praying, and that's a great thing for them, and that helps bring them closer to God, does it for me. For me, again, it's that playing the picking pattern on the guitar. You might say, well, I can't, that doesn't do anything. Going out for a run or going out for, I hate that. I hate the idea of going on a 40-mile bike ride that just doesn't appeal to me. Don't do it. Okay? Find the things that engage you in a relationship with God. So that you might not stray from God. So the things that bring me spiritual life might not be the same things that bring you spiritual life. This is what Jesus is trying to do for today. Drawing a distinction between two different ways of perceiving the world and interacting with one another. He's not distinguishing between, between two entities, flesh and blood, and, and, and body and spirit. That's Gnosticism. He's distinguishing metaphorically between two ways of seeing the world. Do we ignore God in the manner in which we interact with the world, creating a separate pocket for God over here, and another for the real world over there? That is seeking the things of the flesh. Or do we understand that the whole world and everything that we do is a spiritual opportunity, indicating the type of relationship that we have with God? That's what it means to have a spiritual relationship with God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to ooh, deepen our spiritual relationship with you. 
And that might require us to do certain physical things, because our bodies are not evil. They're not inherently bad. You've created us beautiful. We need to overcome this idea that somehow there's a body and a spirit, two separate entities. It's not what Jesus is saying. There's two ways of looking at the world. God lets us look at the world through a spiritual lens. So when we look at our neighbor, we see a beautiful creation of God. So we don't diminish them or hurt them in any way. So we can bring the love of God to them. So when we work and participate in things of life, we understand that these are spiritual pursuits as well. We're doing it to be a blessing to others. For work itself is holy. It helps the world be productive so we can care for each other. That's how we see the world as a spiritual entity. How we see our work as a spiritual opportunity. How we see our bodies as spiritual entities. God, transform our way of thinking that we might not seek the things of the flesh, but the things of the Spirit. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.